Good morning. Today we'll be looking at The Harp of India, a poem written by Henry de Rosio. Before we move into the poem, we'll have a quick look at the author. Henry de Rosio was born in 1809 and he lived up to 1831. He died very young at the age of 22. He was born to an Indo-Portuguese father and an English mother. So he is not purely an Indian, but then he spent his lifetime, his 22 years of life in India, and he claimed himself to be an Indian. He was proud to be called an Indian. He had his schooling at David Drummer's Dhuramthala Academy School. David Drummer was a European who was known for his free thinking and liberal attitude. David Drummer was a person who will willingly brought together the people from different castes, Europeans, Eurasians, brought them together under one school and taught them. So this schooling has played a major role in De Rosio's character formation. He later in his lifetime became a, a liberal thinker uh, he was influenced by religious skepticism. He started questioning many aspects of religion over the course of time. Later, he joined the Hindu college as a professor. There he started an association named as Academic Association, where he constantly encouraged students to think freely, to question and not to accept anything blindly. And his teachings inspired the development of the spirit of liberty, equality, and freedom. De Rosio, along with his students, worked hard to remove social evils, improve the condition of the women and the peasants, and promote liberty through the freedom of press, trial by jury, and so on. It would be right if we say that it was during his time that the intellectual revolution began in in Bengal. He started the Young Bengal Movement, which worked hard for a lot of reformation in the society. Now we'll have a quick look at the major works of Henry de Rosio. He is well known for the poems, The Harp of India, Song of the Hindustani Minstrel, The Fakir of Janghira, To India, My Native Land, and various other poems. Coming to our work, uh, The Harp of India. We shall read the poem once and then move into the analysis. The Harp of India. Why hangest thou lonely on yon withered bough? Unstrung forever, must thou there remain. Thy music once was sweet. Who hears it now? Why doth the breeze sigh over thee in vain? Silence has bound thee with her fatal chain. Neglected, mute, and desolate art thou, like ruined monument on desert plain. Oh, many a hand more worthy far than mine, once thy harmonious chords to sweetness gave, and many a wreath for them did fame and twine of flowers still blooming on the minstrel's grave. Those hands are cold, but if thy notes divine may be by mortal wakened once again, harp of my country, let me strike the strain. The speaker here begins with a question. Why hangest thou lonely on yon withered bough? The word thou refers to the harp and more specifically to the ancient poetic tradition of India. The poet wonders why the harp is hanging lonely on the dry and dead bough and he asks for the reason. 
The poem begins with a melancholic and sad tone. The speaker then moves on to say that the harp, the harp mu the, will remain forever with the dead bow without strings. Just like the dead bow, the harp is also dead. Further, the speaker becomes nostalgic and he refers to the past when the music of the harp was quite meaningful and sweet. Now, the, since the strings are removed, it cannot produce any music and no one listens to it. The harp cannot be wakened by breeze or air that passes by. Or in other words, it is useless to play with now. It is now dead by the silence. And it looks like a ruined monument which is left on a desert plain long back. And the ancient poetic tradition remains neglected, mute and desolate. Moving on to the second part, <clears throat> he begins with a mourning tone, but ends in hope. Here the speaker shifts his interest from harp, the musical instrument, to the one who used the harp to sing melodies. The reference here is to poets, many a hand more, far, more worthy far than mine, that refers to the poets, the ancient poets who used to, produce, to write poetry. He says that those poets produced outstanding poetry. Though they are dead now, their works have kept them alive. That's what he means when he says, many a wreath for them did fame and twine of flowers still blooming on the minstrel's grave. The poets are dead now, they are no more. But they have made a wreath for themselves through the works they have written. He calls their hands cold because they are dead. And he ends this, the, the poem with, a, with an exhortation. He says that if any other mortal can waken you once again, can waken the harp once again, he decides to take that responsibility. And he says that uh, he wishes to revive the past literary works of these poets and hopes that by reviving those works, the glory of India will also be revived. This is what the poem means. Here are a few of the difficult terms explained. For those who are not familiar with the harp, this is what a harp looks like and it is more of a Western musical instrument. Moving into the analysis of the poem. The poem can be seen as a sonnet. If, we remem if you remember the, in the introduction, we talked about the era of the pioneers, the age of the pioneers. We said that they, they were strongly influenced by the West Western tradition. So Henry de Rosio, being one of the pioneers of Indian writing in English, he adopted the form of sonnet. And this poem also has 14 lines and it can be considered as a sonnet. Now what is a sonnet? A sonnet is a 14-lined poem with a fixed rhyme scheme. It was invented by an Italian poet in the 1200s and it means a little song. Sonnets are classified into different types based on the pattern in which they are written. Some sonnets follow a style of an octave plus sestet. An octave is eight line stanza and a sestet is a six line stanza. Or some other sonnets take a different pattern of three quatrains, four lined stanzas, three four line stanzas and a couplet, a concluding couplet. Here this poem can be 
seen as having an octave and a sestet. Usually, in such poems, the octave presents the problem and the sestet attempts to provide a solution to the problem. Here in the octave, the author talks about the decay of the ancient poetic tradition, how it has been neglected, how it has been left unattended. In the sestet, he comes to a solution uh, to the problem mentioned above. He says that if at all it is possible to revive the Indian poetic tradition, then he would take the responsibility. Another important thing that we need to look at in a sonnet is the rhyme scheme. If you look at the poem here, we can find that the first and the third lines rhyme bow and now. The second, fourth, fifth and seventh lines rhyme remain vain, chain, plain. Similarly, mine entwine gave grave so based on that rhyming pattern we can we can uh, understand that the rhyme scheme followed in the sonnet is a b a b b a b c d c d c and b b moving into the themes that are discussed in the poem the main theme is the impact of colonization on the indigenous literature of India. This poem being written in the 19th century when the British rule was most prominent in India. The poet says that the poetry produced in India uh, was beautiful and it was idealistic. But with the coming of Western education, but with the coming of uh, English language, with the introduction of English language, the, the native languages lost their relevance and most of the people ran behind English and the ancient poetic tradition in native languages have lost their importance. That is the main problem he addresses here. And as we said before, the octave presents the problem. It is a lamentation on the glorious past of India. And the sestet ends with an optimistic note, providing a solution to that problem. He says, if at all any mortal can wake thee up, let me strike the strain. Another issue that we find here is the identity issue, the loss of identity of many Indian indigenous poets. This is not a direct uh, theme that is used in the poem, but this can be understood while we read the poem. The poet addresses how the Western education and Westernization has led to the laws of identities of many Indian indigenous poets. The harp can be looked at as a symbol of traditional Indian poetry, of the past poets, and the silence becomes a symbol of the metaphorical death. Moving into the literary devices of uh, used in the poem. There are four main literary devices used. First one is a simile. simile. As you know, simile and metaphor are comparisons of two things. Here I quote, neglected, mute and desolate art thou, like ruined monument on desert plain. Here the harp, the condition of the harp is compared to the condition of a monument, a decayed monument on a desert. Similarly, there is a metaphor which is used. The wreath, uh, he says that the fame has entwined uh, the uh, dead poets with a wreath of flowers. Here the wreath itself refers to the fame that they have attained through the works they have written. So that is a metaphor. Another important literary device is personification. Personification is the attribution of personal nature or human characteristics to something which is non-human. So here, uh, harp is personified. 
harp is often referred to as thou the breeze uh, the poet says that the breeze sighs over the harp so the breeze is personified similarly silence has bound thee with her fatal chain silence is personified and it is important to note that these words are all written with a capital with an uh, 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 start um, they start with a capital letter another literary device is synecdoche uh, which is a figure of speech in which one part of that object is made to represent the whole object for example many a hand uh, here the reference to hand is to refer to the past poets to the ancient poets similarly those hands are called uh, he means that the ancient poets they they are no more they are dead to refer to them he says that those hands are called so th these are the literary devices you will find in the poem what makes this poem essentially indian uh here the main theme that the poem deals with is uh indian in nature uh the theme of the uh, the uh, it is lamentation of the glorious past of indian poetic tradition so the basic theme itself is indian in nature but as we said before henry de rosio being one of the early uh, poets of indian writing indian english literature he was strongly influenced by the western tradition in the case of the form that he uses to write poetry which is a sonnet the sonnet is essentially a western form similarly the use of harp harp is essentially an a, a western image so uh, the use of harp as an image all these are the western influences we, we find here so i hope will uh the we have covered almost all the po points so to to wind up uh we looked at the author first and then we looked at the poem uh and then we analyzed the poem as a sonnet we looked at the rhyme scheme we looked at the themes the literary devices used in the poem and also what makes this work indian and the western influences on this work thank you